will start for this Zoom meeting today. For everyone, you can hear my voice. Thank you. For everyone, Tutu so has entered the room about to begin. So please have a seat and make yourself comfortable. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to the Honorable Associate Professor Dr. Umi Nai Emasarai as a Head Center of Excellence for Social Innovation and Sustainability from University Malaysia Perlis. And a very warm welcome to the participant and student from Stecom University. Is it indeed a pleasure to have all of you on this memorable occasion? And I would like to thank for gathering us here in a visiting lecture program regarding research methodology, a quantitative research. Before we begin, please allow me to read our agenda this afternoon. First session class will be delivered by our guest lecturer, Associate Professor Dr. Umi. And finally, there will be a question and answer session after the presentation and continue with a brief for a photo session at the end. And we will start for this event today. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind all of the participants to turn off the microphone during the session. We will start for this class today. And Associate Professor Dr. Umi Naye Masarai, the time is yours. Thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good evening. First and foremost, my heartiest congratulations goes to Miss Navita and all team from SECOM. All right. So, uh, as we mentioned just now, my name is Umi Naima Binti Sarae. I am the associate professor of one of the faculty in University of Malaysia Police or UNIMAT. Okay, Faculty of Business and Communication. And at the same time, I uh, am in charge for one of the uh, Center of Excellence in UNIMAP called COISIS or Center of Excellence for Social Innovation and Sustainability. Right, and as for today, I'm going to share some of the information and knowledge on research methodology uh, in the perspective of a quantitative research. Okay, for your information, I am teaching research methodology since I am first joined UNIMAP as the academician in 2015. But actually before that, I am attached with UNIMAP since 2002 as the administrative uh, officer. All right, so in 2015, I am joining UNIMAP as, the, as one of the uh, lecturer here. Okay, here is the outline uh, of my today's presentation. Okay, first and foremost, we are going to look on the business research method. And after that, the quantitative research as a survey research method approach. And after that, quantitative research uh, where we will uh, fully depend on the distribution of questionnaire. And the next is about how to uh, channel our distribution method, especially in the term of... Uh, questionnaire distribution. And after that, we are going to look on several sources of error when we develop our questionnaire set. And also uh, what is about response rate and also how to improve the response rate. And after that, we are going to look on several issues that will be need to be reported in chapter three normally uh, in research design, all right? And also the last, uh, uh, subsection or outline for today's presentation is to look on several guidelines in developing a questionnaire. Okay, to not further ado, we go to the first uh, part of this presentation. I think maybe it is better for me to make it in full view like this, all right? So business research method definition, there are several definition of research method uh, depend on the scholar. All right. So if we look on the Saunders definition, Saunders et al. in 2019, business research is something that people undertake in order to find out things in a systematic way, thereby increasing their knowledge. However, if you look at Zipman et al. 2012, they define business research as the application of scientific method in searching of the truth about business phenomena. So based on these two definitions, there are two important keywords that we can spot, which are to find out things, all right? 
uh, in a systematic way and by using a scientific method. Okay, so what is uh, about uh, to find out things? According to Becker 1998, to find out things suggests that there are multiplicity of possible purposes for your research. Therefore, an activity which means it has to be finished at some time to be of use. Uh, then uh, the word systematic suggests that research is based on a logical relationship uh, and not just belief. Pardon, doctor. Uh, we can we we cannot see your PowerPoint. Okay, let me yeah. check. All right. You cannot see my slide from the beginning. Actually, in beginning we can see, but I'm stop for the. Okay the now. Week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how how now it is appear? Yes, is it clear? Okay, I would like to. Now, do I need to? Okay, I try to make it in full view like this. Is this yes. fine? Yes, it is fine. Thank All you. Right, okay now. Okay, now let me continue. All right. So, uh, systematics, okay, it suggests that research is based on logical relationship and not just belief. Therefore, it means that in research, we cannot give any claim or statements or argument only based on our own assumption or our own uh, opinion, okay, or just based on our own belief, but it needs to be made a logical relationship and normally it needs to be supported by any of the empirical evidence. Okay, and the next one, scientific methods. It refers to a set of prescribed procedure for establishing and connecting theoretical statement, for analyzing empirical evidence, and for predicting events yet unknown. The reason for following a scientific method is that the result will be less prone to errors and high confidence and can be placed in the finding. This is according to Sekaran and Bugito, 2010. Therefore, it means that in order for us to conduct any type of business research, first and foremost, we need to make sure that every single step that we are going to take is something that is logical and reasonable and we have the justification of that things. And it has the interrelation between one to another action in our research. All right. So we go to the next one. This is about the quantitative research uh, versus the qualitative research. As we all know, there are two broad approach of uh, doing research, especially in the social science uh, domain. Okay. And as for the qualitative, it is uh, about the understanding of human behavior by asking broad question and collecting word type data that is analyzed and creating a search for teams. Okay, this method is often used as a method of exploratory research. Okay, as we all know, there are two major approach of business research. The first one is qualitative and what we are going to look in details today is the second one uh, called quantitative. Okay, quantitative is referred to the understanding of human behavior by asking a narrow question and collecting numerical data before analyzing the data by utilizing statistical method. So it refers to an investigation of quantitative properties and phenomena and their relationship. Okay, the quantitative research design are descriptive, correlational and causal. And statistic derived from quantitative research can be used to establish the existence of correlational or causal relationship between variables. This type of research can be used to establish generalization fact about the phenomena. And normally, if we have a very limited uh, data at our hands, we will start it with uh, conducting an exploratory research where we will depend more on the qualitative type. And as for the quantitative type of research or approach, we will have more of the information. Therefore, we can uh, start to narrow down our question. Even we will have uh, the, uh, what we call it, the predetermined variables that we are going to uh, investigate. And also we will have some time at, uh, at a stages where we also have the, uh, what we call uh, theory that we can underpin. Uh, based on the logical relationship that we are going to propose in the quantitative research. So questionnaire as respondent for informative using verbal or written questioning and respondents are 
a representative sample of a people. So questionnaire and respondent are two important elements that cannot be run away when we utilize the quantitative type of research approach. Okay, we go to the next one. If we utilize the quantitative, there will be two mechanisms or tools or data distribution that we are going to uh, utilize. We call it interview and sometimes we do an observation. All right, this is for the qualitative. Interview can be done either in the structured, semi-structured, focus group discussion or panel discussion. And as for the observation, approach, we can be the participant or the non-participant while we are uh, maintaining our role as the uh, researcher of that uh, research. But the, as for the quantitative, we only have the questionnaire or some of the scholars, they refer it to the survey, all right, as the tool for us to uh, getting or uh, collecting the data in the quantitative approach. Okay, the questionnaire can be distributed either by using the personal interview, uh, such as door-to-door -door or mall intercept, like what has been done by most of the marketing uh, research. Also, it can be done by telephone or self-administered paper or electronic, right? So questionnaire is categorized in the domain of quantitative research approach. According to Boogie, Sekaran and Bogi 2010, they define that the quantitative research relies on deduction. Okay, it means that there will be one of the theory that is already exists and researchers uh, that utilize the quantitative approach will rely on that theory. And they, from that theory, they try to, uh, what we call it, to provide the interconnection between their variable and also to connect it with the problem or issue before they start uh, the investigation of their study. So according to Saunders et al, they said that quantitative technique, giving simple description of the variables and building statistical relationship among variables. So we can say that quantitative research is more on to find the relationship if it is involved with the correlational or causal type of relationship. However, Quantitative research also can be uh, used the descriptive approach if they are not going to look on the relationship between variables, all right? So according to Cooper and Schindler, 2006, they stated that quantitative method is used to explain, to predict data, and to get probability sampling from larger sample size as compared to qualitative method. And normally, as for the qualitative type of research, we only have about maybe 15 to 20 informants as a person who are going to answer our interview. However, as for the quantitative, normally we will go to a larger or huge scale of sample size. That's why as for the quantitative, it is more generalized, okay, uh, where the findings can be applicable to the uh, generalization for the total population. However, as for the quantitative, since the uh, informant who give the information is quite in a small size, therefore sometimes it cannot be generalized to the total population. Okay, we go to the next one. Questionnaire or survey is a research strategy that collects standardized primary data from large number of respondents. So questionnaire or survey refers to the data collection method in which respondents are asked to respond or self-complete complete to the same set of questionnaires in a predetermined way. All right, so it is tend to be used for descriptive research, which for example, undertaken using attitude and opinion questionnaire will identify and describe the variability in different phenomena or explanatory research. It is also commonly used for explanatory research which enable the examination and explanation of relationship between variables and in particular cause and effect relationship, all right? So it may be used as the data collection method and by using the personal interview, telephone, self-administrated, and it may be linked to another method in a mix or multiple method research design. For example, to discover 
employee attitudes can be complemented by in-depth interview to understand more about the attitudes. This is what we call a mixed method. Okay, some researcher they did a mixed method research. Uh, for example, at first they collect the data by using the quantitative approach. It means that they use a set of questionnaires. So right after they got the result from that quantitative research, they are trying to go in depth of the information by uh, conducting a specific uh, session of interview in the quantitative approach. All right, and after that, the quantitative approach also they will use and uh, analyze the data based on the software that is available in the uh, existing. All right. Okay, and one more thing, of course, as for the exploratory research and explanatory research, uh, if we uh, conduct the quantitative research, we either can go for the descriptive research where we are only to look on the descriptive or the opinion or perception of our respondent towards uh, what kind of issue that we are going to investigate. And another higher level, we go for the correlational and causal where we would like to look on the cause and effect relationship between variables that we selected. And we uh, hardly believe that they have the relationship based on the argument or support uh, that we uh, reveal from the existing literature. Okay, now the quantitative distribution uh, methods. Uh, there are a few. Okay, for example, we start with personal interview. It can be a door-to-door -door and more intercept, a door-to-door -door where the researcher, they go and collect the data from door-to-door. -door. Okay, it depends on what kind of research that they are going to do. And sometimes, most of the marketing research, they are trying to get or to distribute the uh, distribution. Okay, the, they are going to collect the data at the mall intercept. All right, where sometimes uh, they go, uh, we, we, we can get several of the researcher. They come to us at the mall and try to uh, help, uh, to, to get help from us to fill in the questionnaire uh, uh, where they are the one who uh, tick on the questionnaire set. A moment for particular. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me continue. And sometimes it also can be conducted by using a phone call. Okay, in the previous year, most of the uh, uh, data distribution have been obtained from the telephone. Okay, uh, but another type is the self-administered. Okay, it is uh, the paper questionnaire. This is the most popular the uh, questionnaire distribution methods where we have a set of questionnaire. Uh, and after that, we will send that uh, questionnaire set to our respondent and let the respondent uh, fill in the questionnaire form and return back to us as the researcher. And also, uh, in the current or in the uh, trendy world, uh, the self-administered uh, questionnaire also has been distributed by the usage of the electronic questionnaire. Okay, so if people ask us where is the best questionnaire distribution methods? The answer is there are no best form of questionnaire distribution methods. This is because each of these questionnaire type have their own advantages and disadvantages. Okay. The next one. I move to the next slide. A moment, my slide is stuck. Can you still can follow my lecture? Anyone there? Can you see my uh, my slide now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me proceed. Okay. Now let us take a look at the advantages and disadvantages for each quantitative distribution methods. Okay, if uh, we look at the first one, the personal interview, where we can utilize the door to door or mall intercept. Okay, the advantages, uh, if we are using this kind of distributed methods, okay, it will have uh, the advantages first, okay, it will have the high response rate because we are going to meet them face to face and it allow the cl clarification, for example, if the respondent uh, are not so clear with the question that we ask, they can ask. Uh, 
ask us at that time and this may be less expensive however this method will be time consuming all right so the disadvantages it need trainings for the researcher to avoid bias because sometimes as a researcher we might have uh, a set of answer that we uh, are expected from our respondent and sometimes we are going to influence them to got that answer okay and no visual aid right because we are using the conventional way and the high degree of influence from the researcher like i mentioned just now okay so we go to the next one the telephone advantages lower cost versus personal all right because it will involve with one-to-one -one phone call less time consuming compared to the personal but uh, and also it can cover a wide geographic coverage okay we can reach our respondent even though they are located far from us however it also can have its disadvantages Okay, it can be costly in regard to dispersed geographic, uh, geographical sample. Let's say the location is very far. Of course, telephone also will uh, uh, cost uh, the high uh, budgetary, right? And low response rate because some of the respondents might not available by the time we contacted them. And early termination for those who are not interested to continue with answering the questionnaire. All right, so we go to the third one. We call it self-administered by using a paper questionnaire. This is the hard copy, right? So the advantages, lower cost versus personal, less time consuming versus personal, and wide geographic air coverage where we can reach our respondent by uh, post, okay, by mail. And these advantages can be costly in regard to stamp prices. And sometimes the researcher need to give the written envelopes to the respondent. And it is also involved a very low response rate. This is for the um, mail, uh, what we call it, mail uh, type of getting the respondent, okay, uh, the questionnaire back from the respondent. And, and the last one, uh, nowadays after pandemic, right, most of us will utilize this channel, okay, self-administered by using the electronic uh, questionnaire, email, website, Google form, hyperlink, and QR code. The advantages, it is convenient. Uh, it is flexi flexible to uh, uh, what we call it, to add a design, a visual aid, and also it will involve with low cost. However, the disadvantage and the mistake that uh, most of the students and also researcher will engage with, it will uh, connect to the poorly chosen distribution channels can lead to bias data. Okay, low response rate, a host of other potential issues. Okay, for example, we might think that it is easy for us to uh, distribute our questionnaire by using the Google form, right? However, if we are not having uh, the appropriate list of respondents, let's say if we would like to conduct a study by involving the houseman or the medical officer or the nurse in the hospital, but if we don't have the contact number of them, of course, uh, it will involve with the wrong participant who might provide the answer to our questionnaire, right? But as for most of the uh, marketing research, such we would like to do a research on customer satisfaction, maybe towards airline, maybe towards what we call it online platform or airline, uh, uh, such as airline service, Asia and so uh, uh, and etc. So uh, maybe that one, since more of the consumer or respondent uh, might involve with that, therefore the chances for us to got the right respondent or participant will be high. Okay, now we move to the next one, the sources of error in the questionnaire development. There are three sources of error, but I would like to highlight here that uh, error number one and number two, which are measurement question, 
and researcher, these are the sources of error that can be minimized by the respondent. Because, and not by respondent, sorry, by the researcher. Because this kind of error is something that is related or can be controlled by the researcher themselves. Meanwhile, another source of error that involved with the participant of respondent, this is the source of error that we cannot control. Okay, now we look on the measurement questionnaire, the first one. Measurement question may cause of error if the researcher select or create inappropriate question, number one. Number two, ask respondent in appropriate order, okay? And number three, use inappropriate instruction to elicit information. Okay, for example, let's say we would like to conduct a study on customer satisfaction. Okay, when we do a searching, we find a questionnaire on customer loyalty and without further thinking, okay, we just take the questionnaire of customer loyalty to measure our respondent towards customer satisfaction. Of course, this will lead with a very uh, mistake, okay, or error in the term of measurement. And the second one, ask respondent in inappropriate order. Uh, there are several conditions for us to develop a questionnaire. That's why normally at this level, maybe in degree in master, we are not going to develop the questionnaire by our own, but we will more depend on the valid and established questionnaire where we adopted or adapted the questionnaire from the previous sources or previous author. This is because in order to develop a questionnaire, there are several rules. One of them is to ask the respondent from the general one to the specific one. Maybe by the time we are asking the respondent, it will make us involved with the asking respondent not in the appropriate order. And the last one, use appropriate instruction to elicit information. Okay, and the next one, sources of error also might happen in terms of the researcher themselves. If they fail to record answer accurately and completely, okay, if they fail to consistently execute the questionnaire procedure, and if they fail to accurately analyze the questionnaire based on the RQs and ROs. RQs here is the research question, RO is the research objective. I need to be remembered before we finalize our questionnaire, especially in the quantitative approach, we need to make sure what are the variables that we would like to study, okay? And the variables need to be uh, reflected on the issue that occurred because we only conduct a study if there is any issue or problem with that uh, scenario, okay? Uh, for example, if we would like to conduct a study on customer satisfaction, let's say uh, right after pandemic, most of the youth would like to go for travel. So they would like to look on uh, or conduct a study on customer satisfaction, uh, maybe towards one of the local airline okay, in the country. So we need to uh, make sure that the selection of the variable okay, that we are select in order to ask our respondent need to be reflected with the variable that have been highlighted in our research question and research objective in our chapter one. Okay, that one is very important because some people in chapter one, they highlight another issue or problem. Okay, but in chapter two, in the literature review part, they maybe have the tendency to bring in other variables that may be out of the research framework, all right? And in chapter three, now in the uh, questionnaire development, they cannot uh, have the questionnaire that can reflect 100% on the variable that they mentioned in chapter one or in chapter two. So this is kind of error that need to be uh, give a careful attention. Okay, and the next one is participant or respondent, right? 
uh, this may reduce the cost of error if participant must believe that the experience will be pleasant and satisfying. Participant must believe that answering the survey is worthwhile. Participant must dismiss any mental reservation about participant. That's why this kind of error is hard to be controlled. However, in the questionnaire, we will have the cover letter before we asking the respondent. So in that cover letter, we need to cater all of this issue to convince the respondent or participant to join our survey, all right? And that is uh, a voluntary uh, type of participating in the questionnaire, okay? In answering the questionnaire. So these are the sources of error that we need to know because if we uh, involve in this kind of error, for sure, our questionnaire is not accurate and there will be uh, no point to continue with the data analysis, all right? Because we wrongly uh, select or finalize our uh, final uh, questionnaire set. Okay, now we move to the next one. This is about response rate. Okay, response rates is the completion rate or return rate. Response rate refer to the number of people who completed a survey divided by a number of people who make up the total sample group. So it is usually expressed in the form of a percentage. Okay, normally, before we continue with the data analysis, at first we are going to report about how much is the response rate for our uh, data collection. Okay, so a response rate of 50% or more in a survey is considered excellent. Okay, there are also several opinion based on the previous author regarding the percentage of response rate. Okay, where 50% or more in survey is considered excellent. And I'm sorry, I forget to cite the name of author who give this information. Okay, if customer satisfaction survey and market research, surveys often have response rate in the 10 to 30% range. Okay, it is considered fine and good and uh, can be continued for the next uh, data analysis. Employee survey typically have a response rate of 20%, 35% to 60%. Okay, type of response rate. Uh, the first one, we call it non-contact rate. This is a ratio of potential but unreached contact to all potential contacts. A contact may be unreachable due to a busy, no signal, answering machine or voicemail and disconnected. Uh, these participants might involve in our study, but unfortunately, they are not available by the time we contacted them. And the second one is the refusal rate, okay? This rate is referred to the ratio of contacted participants who decline to participate as a potential contact, all right? And the last one is a non-complete rate, a ratio of contacted participants who not completely answer the distributed, uh, distributed questionnaire. And what needs to be done for the non-complete rate? Of course, we as a researcher cannot fill in the answer for that uh, respondent. Uh, and we need to put aside and cannot uh, take that into account. Okay, we only need to uh, uh, proceed with data analysis for the questionnaire that 100% complete. So how to uh, calculate the response rate? It is total number of questionnaires delivered to respondent. Let's say we delivered 500 and the total number of questionnaires written at risk just hand. Let's say 350. So the response rate will be 350 divided by 500 and multiplied by 100 equals to 70%. Okay, can you still follow me? Yes, Miss. Okay, so I continue. Okay, now we move to the improving the response rate. Okay, how we can improve the response rate? Okay, uh, there are several challenges for researchers or students when they would like to conduct a study. Uh, starting from the, the beginning, okay, it is very hard to find the issue or problem that occurs. Okay, 
and if they already can get the issue or problem and the problem can be supported by the data or statistic, all right, so they can move with identifying what are the variables that they are going to uh, find. So that one will be included in the literature review section. Okay, there are concept of several of the variables that they are going to test. And after that, they are going to find a good and accurate and appropriate questionnaire to measure the variables that they uh, select just now in chapter two. However, by the time they already have a very full and complete set of questionnaire and they have a very detailed information from where the questionnaire is adapted or uh, adopted, the next challenges is to make sure that the participant will uh, happy to involve with their questionnaire. Okay, this is because sometimes uh, we cannot make sure that we will have the 100% of the customer of the respond rates. However, this is something that we cannot control. Okay, here are some of the steps that can be taken by us as the researcher if we would like to increase the percentage of our response rate. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, this is the page uh, I, I give uh, my example of my previous uh, questionnaire. And please ignore that part, all right? And we go to the advanced notification number one. Advanced notification, notification may be as for the degree student, you might have lack of time in completing your uh, research report, right? Uh, in my institution, in Unimap, uh, the final year student, the degree student are given about two semesters to complete their FYP, final year project. So the advanced notification can be done if we already finalize our targeted respondent and we will have a, what we call initial uh, networking with them. Okay, for example, we will go to HR department okay, to talk with the in charge there, that we are going to come to their organization and we are going to distribute our questionnaire maybe uh, a month, okay, a month later. A moment. All right, okay, and after that, uh, maybe we give the advance, it means that we give the advance notification, let's say by April, we are going to collect our data then in uh, March, we are going, uh, we, we go and got the early connection or network with the person in charge in that organization or institution. And after that, the second way is we can do a reminder. This is something that can be uh, blast from email or from WhatsApp, right? And it depends on the distributed channel that we choose just now. Either we are going to make it online 100% or we are going to use the conventional way, right? But we still can do a reminder. Maybe right after two weeks when we deliver, uh, uh, distribute the questionnaire, then we will remind them, okay? We are expecting the respondent to fill in and complete the questionnaire and please uh, return it back to us at this number, okay? Or at this email uh, address. So we need to make a reminder to the respondents or participants. So the next one, written direction and devices. We need to have a very clear instruction on this, okay? How they are going to return back that uh, questionnaire to us and how they are going to return it. Because there are several ways. Sometimes, uh, let's say we would like to give, uh, we like would like to uh, distribute a questionnaire. We may be only involved with the HR officer in one of the organization, and we will pass the questionnaire set to the HR officer. Let's say two hundred in organization A, and the HR officer will help us to distribute the questionnaire set to the employees in the organization, and right after that. We need to uh, make a very clear in information in the cover letter how the respondent will return back, okay, the completed questionnaire to us, okay, either through the HR officer or they can submit directly to us as the researcher. Okay, and some of the uh, researcher, they are also 
provide the monetary incentive. Okay, this is for the researcher that have been grant. But as for the degree student, I don't think that this is applicable. But okay, I also have some experience by the time I am in the my degree, yes, okay. By that time I am in the university in one class and right after we finish one of the examination, there are some person come to our exam hall and he give the rest uh, give us the questionnaire set and also they give some of the uh, by that time we call it now that is a calculator the electronic calculator as the token of appreciation for all of the participants but this is maybe not applicable to everyone because it will involve the monetary uh, implication and also in the uh, cover letter we need to uh, highlight the participant deadline because you know by the time we have collect all of the information we would like to put it a stop where we are start want to start the analysis uh, phases okay so the participation deadline need to be uh, highlighted in the cover letter and please also promise of anonymity where we cannot ask our respondent to reveal themselves and we need to highlight that uh, we are interested to got the information at whole and we are not targeting uh, to them as their personal opinion okay and the analysis also will be done at whole uh, by looking at the total uh, respondent that will uh, answer the questionnaire and the last one appeal for participation okay by using a very nice uh, wording in the uh, cover letter that we enclose together with our questionnaire set okay i move to the next one issues in research design can you follow me until this part may i know how many participants online Forty-four okay. in Zoom, miss. Okay, all right. So, so I continue, yeah. I continue. We are still at uh, slide number twelve, and this now is three forty-five. Okay, let me continue. Okay, issues in research design. In reporting the research design, especially on highlighting about the quantitative research, we will spell out in chapter three. Okay, normally a research uh, project need to produce five chapter. Chapter one, introduction. Chapter two, literature review. Chapter three, they need to spell out all of the research design together with the information about the quantitative research in chapter three okay and chapter four data analysis chapter five conclusion and discussion discussion and conclusion so issues in research design uh, as can be seen here there are about nine issues or nine key points that need to be reported in chapter three okay it will start with purpose of study study setting unit of analysis time horizon, operationalization, measurement, or the questionnaire, all right? After that, sampling, data collection method, pre-testing, and data analysis. So we go to the first one, the purpose of study. There are two major purpose of study. Either it is exploratory study or explanatory study. Okay, exploratory study are mainly refer to the clarification study. And explanation studies may involve descriptive, correlational, or causal study. All right. And at the higher level of the quantitative study, normally they will uh, involve with the causal study where they would like to look on the cause and effect of the variable that has been selected. Okay, in the first phase, in chapter three, we need to report the purpose of the study is explanation. All right, so that one we need to declare it. And after that, we'll go to the next point. It is regarding the study setting. It also can be categorized into two. The first one, we call it field setting or non-experimental setting. The second one, we call it laboratory setting or experimental setting. Okay, as for the field setting, 
Okay, the researcher uh, researching on the topic associated with people behavior, it takes form like questionnaire to obtain raw data from the natural environment. If the researchers want to do researches that concerning people's thought, they should do field research instead. Non-experimental research tend to have a high level of external validity, meaning it can be generalized to the larger population. Okay, this is the common type of study setting that most of the social science researcher will be involved with. Okay, they just uh, uh, engage with the data collection through questionnaire. All right, and the second one, laboratory setting where lab research is referring to the research which is done inside the lab. They set up experiments and do tests inside the control environment, okay, in the laboratory. In this way, researchers were able to test their theories precisely and their findings reliability is ensured because the experiment and test will not be affected by other variables. When researchers are doing topics like brain or mind or simply want to test the responses from brain, they should do the lab research as it can provide them a precise finding. And most of the social research, especially, will go for the field setting uh, where they will involve with the questionnaire in the form of the explanation uh, purpose of study. Okay, we go to the next one. It is about unit of analysis first. Okay, the measure entity or respondent that we are analyzing in our study. It can be categorized into these six types, all right? Uh, and actually, the selection of unit of analysis will depend on the issue that occurred, all right? So it can be referred or can be categorized under the individual unit of analysis, dyadic unit of analysis, group unit of analysis, organization unit of analysis, state unit of analysis, or country unit of analysis. So the first one, we go to the individual unit of analysis first. Okay, as for the individual unit of analysis, this might be applicable. And as for me, this is the very easy uh, unit of analysis that we can choose. However, it needs to be reflected with the issue of our study. For example, if we would like to conduct a study that focus on employee performance, okay, in one of the organization, let's say we would like to conduct a study about uh, employee performance in uh, Cellcom. Maybe Cellcom here in Malaysia is one of the telecommunication uh, organization, okay, telecommunication industry, Cellcom. So we would like to conduct a study on employee performance. Therefore, we can go to Cellcom, any branches of Cellcom, and we can distribute our questionnaire to each of the employees because they will represent their individual perception in order to answer our questionnaire. Okay, so that would engage with the individual unit of analysis because each of the employees in that organization will be the participant in answering our questionnaire. Okay, so we go to the next one, the diet. Okay, the diadic uh, unit of analysis. Okay, I would like to create one of the examples for diadic. Let's say we are again, uh, uh, we are going to conduct a study about lecturer performance. Okay, a docent, a lecturer performance in one of the university. Let's say in Unimax. Okay, I am one of the lecturer in Unimax. Okay, I was supervised and I was evaluated by my dean. Okay, in my faculty. So if we are utilizing the unit of analysis in the dyadic uh, approach, let's say we need to give a two type of questionnaire. The first questionnaire will go to me, okay, as the lecturer or the academician in my faculty. So I'm going to answer about my performance in the questionnaire. And at the same time, there are another set of questionnaire that have been distribution, distributed to my uh, supervisor or my boss, which is my dean. And to my dean, the questionnaire is asking my dean to rate the performance of me, not to rate performance of my dean. Okay, so I am answering the questionnaire to rate the performance of myself, individual performance, like the first just now. And at the same time, my dean also need to rate or answer the questionnaire regarding to that uh, particular employee performance. 
So that one we call it guiding. And then the two questionnaire will be collect back and will be analyzed. All right. So this might be involved with a very uh, time consuming and sometimes the lecturer or the employee already uh, answer the questionnaire, but maybe the boss is not uh, free to answer uh, the questionnaire to rate uh, the performance of the employee. But this is a type of research that normally be conducted because some of the researcher believe performance might be biased if we only ask the person to read about themselves. Of course, they will give a high uh, level of rating about their performance. That's why we need to also ask the important person who are in hierarchy is uh, have the power to evaluate or to give the uh, rating towards that uh, employee. Okay, that is about diet. And the third one is the group unit of analysis. Okay, as the group unit of analysis, this is something that involved with uh, several uh, group or organize uh, organ, uh, group sometimes in a department of the organization. Okay, maybe we would like to look on performance uh, based on several group or department in an organization. So we will go to the group of uh, department in organization and maybe two or three person will be represented that group or that department in answering the questionnaire. So no need for us to go and uh, give our questionnaire to each of the employees or person in that group. Okay, there is applicable is several representative for that group answer the questionnaire. So they will represent the whole group. And the organization also the same. They say we would like to conduct a study on organizational performance just now, individual performance or employee performance, not organizational performance. Therefore, we need to go to a few or a list of organization to ask them information about the performance of their company. Therefore, maybe the CEO or the owner of that company, uh, what we call it, uh, the person who can provide the answer uh, when uh, uh, the researcher would like to ask about the organization performance. So if we involve with the organizational unit of analysis, it means that we are having more work to do. Because instead of only going to one organization and get the uh, question, questionnaire from each of the employees in one organization, but as for the organization, we need to go to several organizations and only a few person uh, need to answer the, uh, the questionnaire to represent the whole organization. Okay, the next also with the state and also the country unit of analysis, okay, where we only have a few of people to answer the questionnaire and their opinion will represent the whole state or the whole country. All right, now we go to the next one about time horizon. In research, there will be two types of time horizon. We call it cross-sectional studies. And the next one, we call it longitudinal studies. Okay, as for the first one, cross-sectional studies, based on the data are collected from respondent at a single moment in time. It means that this is a one-off type of study. We only distribute the questionnaire one time and by the time we collect back the questionnaire, we go to the uh, analysis phases. Okay, But as for the longitudinal studies, the study based on the data collected from respondent at different time, thus allowing analysts to changes over time. Okay, for example, purchasing habits over time and also entrepreneurial intention over time. Okay, for example, just imagine during your first time joining your university, okay, there are some researchers who would like to know about the entrepreneurial intention among the study, uh, among the students. So uh, during the orientation week, they will give a set of questionnaire asking students about the entrepreneurial intention by the time they are first joining the university. Okay, right after that, maybe before the graduation, the researcher once again, get that uh, same questionnaire set and go to that same batch of students. And after three or four years, they are asking again about the entrepreneurial intention uh, from student. And from that, they would like to look and analyze of the uh, changing in the perception of student right, right after they already uh, be 
uh, as the student in that uh, university. So they will see the changes by the time in the orientation week and also the week right after, uh, before the student graduated. Okay, that what we call it longitudinal studies. Of course, this uh, might be involved with more challenges instead of just do the one off type of study. Okay, the next one issues in research design. Okay, let me see. We we still have time. Okay, it is almost four. All right, issues in research design. This is regarding the operationalization and measurement. Okay, what is operational definition? Okay, it refers to the concept that can be measured. This can be achieved by looking at the behavioral dimension or facet denoted by the concept. The measurement for many concepts has already been developed by researchers. When reviewing the literature, note reference that discuss instrument used to tap a concept in the study. Okay. Operational definitions will be different with the conceptual definition. Some people refer it as the conceptual definition and some people call it definitions of key term. Conceptual definitions or definitions of key term need to be reported or need to be placed in chapter one. Okay, normally at the last subsection in chapter one, we need to provide the conceptual definition. However, this is different with operationalized operational definition. Operational definitions need to be placed or need to be reported in chapter three. It need to come together. It need to be reported together with the questionnaire that we adapted or we adopted from the previous skill. As for the degree student, I don't think that we are somebody to develop our own questionnaire. Therefore, we will much depend on the established questionnaire that have been introduced by the previous author. And sometimes, some of the previous author, by the time they introduce the questionnaire, they are also give us the operational definition of that particular questionnaire. All right. So there are four types of measurement scale. All right. This is about scale that can be applied. Either it is nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. We are going to look at uh, about it later. Okay, so now we need to clear about the operational definition first. For example, this table 3.5 is the measurement of career satisfaction, okay, according to Greenhouse et al. 1990. And the operational definition for career, career satisfaction in this study uh, can be captured by the aspect of income. Okay, if you look at the items, uh, it will be uh, on income as the respondent on about income, overall success, advancement, career goals, and skill development. So this can be uh, defined uh, how this uh, measurement uh, is operationalized. All right. So this is also have the scale of the questionnaire, and we call it as the interval scale. Okay, Likert scale is under the category of interval scale. We have the five points Likert from strongly disagree to uh, five uh, strongly agree. All right, we move to the next one. This is about the scale. Measurement scale, nominal and ordinal. Okay, uh, we are go not going to look on the explanation, all right? But if you look at the example on the right side, nominal scale is used for labeling variable without any quantitative value. So... Uh, most of the time, we are utilizing the nominal scale when we are asking about the demographic search, uh, data from our respondent. So, example, we ask in here about the nationality, American, Chinese, Australian, German, Indian, and so forth. Right? We call this uh, nominal scale. The second one is ordinal scale. Ordinal scale is the order of the value in what's important and significant. Can, uh, but the differences between each one is not really known. Okay, uh, this is uh, the type of scale that uh, we need to put the rank. Uh, for example, we need to give the ranking of importance from one to five. Maybe three, complete a work, a whole task from beginning to end, we put it as our first ranking. Interact with others, we put it as second ranking. So this kind of scale, we call it ordinal scale. Okay, now we look on the third scale, we call it interval scale, the most popular scale in the quantitative research approach, all right, we call it like a scale. We have the scale, either it is from one to five, or some researcher, they use the scale of one to six, one to seven, 
a one to four. It is uh, up to them. And I believe they have a very strong reason for introducing that scale by the time they develop the uh, instrument. So uh, as a researcher, as a new researcher, we just follow what type of scale that had been uh, introduced by that uh, established uh, questionnaire. And the last one, we call it ratio scale. Ratio scale represents the absolute amount of variable, okay? You can look at the example on the right side. Uh, for example, how many other organizations did you work for before joining the system? So as the respondent, we just uh, put it a number here. But as for me, if people ask me, I rather to take uh, the first scale, the, uh, we call it the nominal scale, because I would like to give a categorize uh, for uh, give, give a categories for my respondent to tick. Okay, rather to put this as the open ended. Uh, for me, it might better to use the uh, nominal scale because it is easy for us to analyze. However, however, some of the question they might not be so relevant to use the nominal scale. In that cases, we need to go uh, and use the ratio scale like this all right so we leave to the respondent to uh, jot down their answer okay without uh, giving the option for the respondent to tick okay now we go to the two types of uh, measurement rating versus ranking all right uh, a rating scale is a method that requires the respondent to assign or rate a value sometimes numeric to the rated object as a measure of some rated attribute Okay, and the ranking scale is a survey uh, tool that measure respondent preferences by asking them to rank their views on a list of related items. Okay, uh, below one, false choice ranking, pet comparison and comparative are the example of ranking scale, all right? And as for the rating scale, like a scale is the most popular one, the Gautama scale, category, semantic differential, itemized rating table, and also graphic rating scale is some of the example under the rating scale. Okay, so we move to the next slide. So here are the issues in research design. This is uh, regarding the sampling, okay. Uh, the process of selecting a yeah. certain number of elements from the population, okay. Hence, by studying okay. the sample and understanding the characteristics of the sample, it would be possible to generalize the characteristic to the whole population elements. A moment, yeah. I will ask Miss Navita, where should we start? Where should we stop? Okay. Okay. Here are the four important key points when we talk about sampling. We need to know about the population, about the case of element, about the sample, or about the subject. So we can look what is population. It refers to the entire group of people, event, or objects of interest to the researcher. Okay, let's say that uh, on the right side, on the below or bottom, uh, bottom right side, the population is the all. And the case or element is a single member of a population. And after that, we need to know about the sample. A sample, all right, is a subset of a population. And each of a single member under a sample we call it as a subject. Okay, this is several of them that we need to know before we need to understand further about sampling uh, technique and also sample and population. So here are about the sampling method or sampling technique. Okay, there are two methods or two uh, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Okay, so in which type of sampling that we need to utilize, it will depend on the uh, population. I always share this information to my student. If we have the number of total population, Okay, that involved in our study, we will go to the probability sampling. But if don't have the number of population, all right, and that will be involved in our study, we will go to the non-probability sampling. Okay, we look on the probability sampling. Element in the population has a known chance of probability of being selected as sample subject. Probability sampling is a method in which the subject or the population get an equal opportunity to be selected as a representative sample. 
And this design is used when the representativeness of the sample is important for the purpose of generalize, generalize, uh, generalizability. Okay, under the probability sampling, there are several techniques that we need to choose. Normally, we only need to choose one. And this type of uh, sampling technique need to be reported in chapter three in a quantitative research. Let's see, we choose probability sampling because we have the number of population of our uh, respondent. So after that, we need to pick uh, which type of sampling technique under the probability sampling that will be utilized. And if we are using the non-probability sampling, okay, so it means that the elements do not have a known or predetermined chance of being selected as a sub, uh, of a subset. And the representativeness of the sample is less important for the purpose of generalizability. And there are several techniques that can be utilized under the non-probability sampling, such as judgmental, convenience, quota, panel, and snowball sampling. Okay, so we move to the next slide. This is regarding the data collection and sources of data collection. Of course, as we all know, okay, this is a very common one. Data collection is an important aspect of any type of research study. Inaccurate data collection can impact the result of a study and ultimately lead to invalid results. Okay? The two main sources of data for research are primary data and the second one is the secondary data. Primary data is the data that we are going to collect by using our questionnaire, where we are the original person who got the original answer from the respondent. So the data collected from the original source first hand. So if we involve with the quantitative, the questionnaire will be referred as our primary data. Okay, and at the same time, secondary data also can be retrieved either from journals, company report, government publication, analysis industry, website, internet, etc. So data collected by readings, data that is being reused. Uh, if you realize in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, we will involve with many of the secondary data. Okay, but as for the, when we enter in chapter three, when we are going to find our own uh, data, okay, by using our own questionnaire, so we will involve with the primary data uh, that we are uh, collecting originally from us, okay. So the next one, this is about data analysis, also an important thing to be reported in chapter three. A pre-testing is where a questionnaire is tested on a statistic small sample of respondents before a full-scale study. So the purpose is to identify any problems such as unclear wording, ambiguous instruction, or the questionnaire taking too long time to be answered. So it, it is a stage in survey. The researcher evaluate the reliability and validity of the survey instrument. Survey is, instrument is referred to the questionnaire before distributing the final questionnaire to the full-scale study or in the actual study then the necessary improvement can be made based on their pre-testing feedback. So these are two comments of the data analysis tool that have been mainly used by the researcher in the quantitative method. Okay, the first one we call it SPSS, all right? And the second one is the smart PLS. Okay, SPSS uh, statistic is a software package used for interactive or batch statistical analysis. Okay, it can be easily be installed and also we can buy the uh, what we call it the software and also smart pls is another tools and and if people ask me which one is better so as for me and as for the degree or even the post grad study uh, this is only about the tools okay the important things is to make sure that we have a clear issue the issue is linked to our variables and we have a good and appropriate questionnaire all right before we go to the analysis data and in this part either we use space as or smart uh, smart bill as it is doesn't matter as long as it can answer the research question that we develop in our research uh, in our chapter one okay so either you would like to, to use the SPSS or SMART PLS, I think it is doesn't matter. 
So both of these tools are still uh, relevant. And some, even some of people say SpaceX is uh, a type of conventional, right? But as long as it still can be used to answer the research question that we made in chapter one, uh, it is fine. We can either use SPSS. Uh, maybe uh, if we are going to uh, have a smart PLS, okay, because nowadays most of the student or researcher would like to use smart PLS, it is also uh, good for us to, uh, to what we call it, to use this uh, software. Because if comparing to smart PLS, uh, by the time you are using uh, to test the, I mean, the mediation effect. If we go for smart PLS, I think that will be uh, better for us uh, because the, what we call it, the step in uh, clicking, okay, to get the result is uh, more simple as compared to the SPSS as if we would like to look on the mediation effect, all right? So the next one, this is the guideline in develop the questionnaire, okay? This is why, we are not going to develop our own questionnaire because all of the established question, um, questionnaire, they have uh, fulfilled this kind of, uh, this kind of guideline, okay? A guidance or guideline. So principle of wording number one, principle of measurement number two, format or survey questionnaire will be number three, the three main guidelines in development, uh, developing the questionnaire. So several factors related to the RQs and ROs need to be considered when choosing the mode of questionnaire. All right. A moment, let me check the chat box. Okay. Okay, now uh, the principle of wording, we have number one until number five. Okay. The first one is the content and purpose of question. Number two, language and sentence in questionnaire. Number three, type and form of question. Number four, layout. Number five, classification of data and personal information. This is under the uh, guideline number one, principle of wording. Okay, the next one, we look on the content and purpose of question. Okay moment okay number one content and purpose of question studied variables will determine the type of question that we ask for the subjective variables such as satisfaction motivation okay and the question should ask the dimension or element of those concepts for objective variables such as age gender direct question uh, are adequate Okay, uh, it means that if we are going to ask our respondent about their feeling, such as satisfaction or motivation, according to the previous researcher, as for the motivation, we have the extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. So there are several dimensions that need to be catered in order for us to get a very detailed perception regarding our respondent's level of motivation. So we need to follow that one. Okay, and as for the objective, such as we just would like to ask about our respondent age, gender, okay, education, income, we just go a direct question. And normally this kind of uh, variable, objective variable, we will utilize the nominal scale, okay. Uh, the scale that normally we use to ask the respondent about their demographic or their profile. Okay, we go to the next one. Language use and sentence in question. The usage of language must accordance to the same level of proficiency of the respondent. Number one, selection of sentences and word which is used depend on the education level of respondents. And number three, have to avoid jargon and bombastic words. Because, you know, okay, if we use a bombastic words, not all of our respondents are familiar with that word. And also the usage of language must accordance to the same level of proficiency of the respondent. We cannot ask the sentence or question that might be, uh, might not clear uh, in the perspective of our respondent. And sometimes also we need to translate the questionnaire in the local language. Uh, for example, we might have our feeling if we conduct a study to the graduates, maybe, uh, to students who already uh, 
left the university, we expect they have a very good level of uh, English language. But there are some research saying that it's not applicable. We still need to ensure that the respondent 100% understand each of the sentence that we ask in the questionnaire. Therefore, if you look at most of the questionnaire, they will come in three languages. Okay, the first one, because most of the questionnaire is adapted from the foreign country, from the Western country. So the English version is there. So by the time maybe it is uh, used again in our country. So let's say in Malaysia, we will translate uh, that questionnaire in the Bahasa Melayu language. Okay, so it will have the three language. All right, because the important is we need to ensure that our respondent 100% understand, okay, on what we are asking them. Okay, the next one, type and form of question. Okay, type of question refers to either open question or closed question. Form of question by referring to positively or negatively worded question and also biasness, biasness in question. All right? Because some of the questionnaire, there are in a positive worded and sometimes in a negative worded. Uh, this is on... This is what we call it. This is a build in order to make sure that the respondent is aware uh, with the questionnaire. If not, if they are involved with the Likert scale, they will have the tendency to only strongly disagree to each of the uh, questions that have been asked. Okay, the next one, open-ended questionnaire, allow respondent to answer in such a way that they are interested in. For example, what are the three things you like most about business faculty? Right. So the close-ended question, Ask respondent to make a choice from a set of alternative given. The management cares about your health and safety issue. So the researcher will give five alternative options. Strongly disagree, SDA. Strongly agree, DA. Neutral agree, and SA is strongly, dis uh, uh, strongly agree. Therefore, the respondent can pick which is more or the close to their feeling. So all item in the questionnaire using a scale of nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio is close-ended question. So close-ended question is to help respondent to make a fast choice of respondent. If not, if we are giving them a, the open-ended question, they need to think and they need to provide the answer. Okay, so open-ended creates opportunities for respondents to reveal their perception without boundaries, okay? And close-ended makes it easier to researcher when do the coding for analysis. Okay, we only have about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, I will try to make it fast. So, uh, so this is still in number three. This is about the positive and negative for the question. If you look at the upper one, the management care about your health and safety issue. Okay, if we use the negative sentence, the management does not care about your health and negative issue. So the sentence is more on the positive worded question. So the aim of uses, using positive and negatively worded question is to ensure that respondents stay alert and involved in answering question. All right. However, if you use the negative worded question in getting the response from your respondent later on in the analysis part, you need to uh, change back uh, that uh, information uh, into the uh, positive sentence. Let's say in questionnaire, you use the negative sentence and the respondent asks number one, strongly disagree. But later on, when it goes to the analysis part, part by the time you key in the answer, you cannot put number one as for the strongly disagree, but you need to put number five as it reflects with strongly agree. Okay, that one maybe can be touched by your lecture later. All right. So the next one, biasness in question. There will be seven types of biasness, starting from double barrel, ambiguous recall, dependent length of question, leading question, loaded question, and social desirability. There are seven biasness in developing the questionnaire. That's why we will not develop our own questionnaire. It will involve and very time consuming. Okay, that's why we just trying very hard to got the questionnaire from past researcher where we can adapt that questionnaire or we can adopt 100% original from that questionnaire. Adapted in which we only alter a bit of that questionnaire without changing the original meaning. Adopted where we take 100% questionnaire same as what have been introduced by that author. 
Alright. So now number one and number two, double barrel question. Okay. Uh, if you look here in one question, they ask uh, two, two questions in one sentence. For example, the assignment of this class is challenging and difficult to get high mark. Maybe some students, they feel that one is challenging, but that is not difficult to get high mark. But maybe someone uh, perceive that the assignment is not challenging, but it is difficult to get high mark. So this kind of double barrel question need to be split into two. The assignment of this class is challenging, okay? And it is difficult to get high mark for assignment of this class. All right. So number two, another bias that might occur, ambiguous question. Prevent from asking questions that are ambiguous. Are you happy? Okay, this is a very ambiguous question. Happy of what? Okay, we need to clearly state uh, about the happy in terms of what perspective. Maybe uh, based on the course, the university, the curriculum, the lecturer. So the respondent may make a different interpretation, although research study conducted uh, in university student as an example. Because students also have very uh, different perception of their happiness, right? Okay, the next bias, number three, recall dependent question. Question that require the respondent recall the event in the past. Okay, maybe it is hard for them to recall what is their feeling in the past years. So what do you feel when you rated your employee Jenny five years ago? Of course, we cannot give a very clear or accurate answer for this. Okay, where do you buy your first attire using your first salary? Maybe it is very hard for us to recall the situation and do our rating. And number four, make sure the questionnaire are simple, compact, and easy to understand. As a rule of thumb, a question or a statement in the questionnaire should not exceed 20 words. Okay, that is a length of question. The next one is a leading question. Okay, uh, in this case, we give the question, but we uh, at the same time uh, would like uh, or would influence our respondent to uh, control the answer. Okay, for example, country X has a weapon of mass destruction and it should rightly be attacked. All right, so we can rephrase to to what extent do you think country X poses WMD? So this is a leading question. We need to avoid this. The next one, loaded question. In one question, we put emotionally charged manner. For example, a student who duplicating senior's assignment should be punished into the disciplinary action. So the word duplicating and display, disciplinary action is full of emotive words. Therefore, we might need to rephrase the question two, student must be honest in doing the assignment. So it is more uh, positively worded question, right? And student who are dishonest in doing the assignment must be pun punished into the disciplinary action. This is just for the example. And the last one, social desirability question. Question must be worded in such a way to avoid social desirable response. Uh, for example, Female students who are Muslim should wear a shawl when attending classes, all right? So since Muslim society expect every woman to wear the attire in the Islamic way, and therefore the response will be strong agreement, generally because that is uh, what is socially desirable answer, not from that one particular individual to answer. Or some another example, did you smoke during pre uh, pregnancy, yes or no? So mothers tend to answer, no, even they have smoked during pregnancy because this is something that is not allowed by the society. So this is a type of social desirability question. Okay, now uh, guideline number four, sequence of question, all right? Question should be asked from a general question into a more specific question. We call it final approach from the broad one to the specific one. So question should be asked from the simple one followed by the difficult question. And number... Uh, five, classification of data and personal information. Data in the form of in personal information and demographic question, such as gender, age, education level, and income. Okay, and avoid asking the name of respondent unless it was absolutely necessary, especially when the questionnaire Necess uh, to match with the respondent. Uh, it is like uh, the example that I give just now regarding the didactic approach unit of analysis where we uh, really need to reveal the name of the respondent. But at most of the time, we will not ask the respondent to 
jot down their, their name or jot down their ID card or jot down their uh, metric cards. Alright, so demographic question can be asked at the beginning or at the end of questionnaire. If you look at the questionnaire design, some of the researchers, they are happy to ask the demographic section at the beginning of the questionnaire. And some of the researchers, they ask the questionnaire first, the variable that involved with the variable. And at the uh, end of the questionnaire, only they ask the respondent to uh, give the information on the personal or demographic uh, data. So number two, principle of measurement, okay. Uh, refers to the scale used such as nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio just now. So researcher must ensure that the scale used to assist in testing the hypothesis, coding the data, test reliability, and validity. So testing goodness of measure in the term of reliability and validity. So these stages that must occur if a question is to be reliable and valid. All right. So reliability and validity are concepts used to evaluate the, research, uh, the quality of research. The reliability is about the consistency of a measure and a validity is about the accuracy of a measure. It's important to consider reliability and validity when you are creating your research design, planning your methods and writing up your result, especially in a quantitative research. This is uh, compulsory for us to be conducted. Okay, even though in the postgrad, uh, among the postgrad uh, study level, uh, during the proposal defense, also they already conducted their reliability and validity tests to make sure that the adapted or the questionnaire are reliable and valid before they can convince the exam uh, or the panel, okay, to uh, go for the further stages in their research, okay. Uh, and normally, uh, when we talk about goodness of measure, uh, we will find the reliability and also we will make sure that the questionnaire that we took from the past researcher are valid, all right? So if these two, uh, uh, what we call it, conditions are good, then we can easily proceed to the next stage. Okay, the, I, I guess this is maybe the last one, the format of survey question. This one also need to be reported in chapter three. So introduction to the respondent by using a cover letter. So we state confidentiality of information where we will not reveal the information of our respondent to any of the third party. Give your name as a researcher, our address, our telephone, okay? And state the purpose of the investigation as well as we need to thank you for the participant of our respondent. And at the same time, we need to make sure that the instruction for filling out the questionnaire is very clear. So uh, use section to organize questionnaire neatly. Maybe our questionnaire will involve with several sections. Uh, like the explanatory research, there are several variables that we have finalized and we are going to test. So maybe it will start with the uh, section of the demographic and then variable number one, variable number two, variable number three, and so forth. All right, so we also need to give a clear instruction to the respondent for each of the section because some of the variable might have several or different type of instruction, okay? So we need to very neatly and go very detailed in order to give a very clear instruction to our respondent. And also it is important uh, on the appearance of our survey question or questionnaire question, it should be neat, create alignment, use margin, make it very nice, okay? Uh, use with good spacing, do not compress the questionnaire to save cost, therefore the respondent might feel very hard to read the question, all right? So uh, I think that's all and thank you for your time and attention. Uh, yes, I have make it on time. Is this one, Miss Novita? Yes, me. Okay, thank you for uh, I'm sorry. Thank you for Associate Professor Dr. Umi for your presentation. It's a very amazing and wonderful presentation. And this is new knowledge for us. And then we will go to the next session, question and answer session. For all audience, if you want to ask question, you can raise in your hand or you can write in the room chat. Okay, first, maybe I will read question from audience in the YouTube. This is from 
Miss Diah Rahmi, which method that more effective and efficient between taking the data of respondent on the village of the mount mountain area using take home anchor or by using distribute the questionnaire on WhatsApp group? Okay, thank you for the good question. All right. So, which data distribution is good, right? Okay, actually, we in order to conduct a research, we need to look back on the issue of the research. And before we select what method that we are going to collect our data, first and foremost, we need to have a very clear information. Let's say if we are involved with the quantitative research, Therefore, we need to have a list of the population. Either we have the population or not, right? If we have the list of the population, normally we will go to the probability sampling. If we don't have the population sample, we go to the non-probability sampling. Okay, now let's say we have the list of our respondent. And this need to be bear in mind. It need to be reflect back on the title of our research. Okay, because we need to control who are going to give the response to our questionnaire. If we got the responses from the wrong person, it will lead to the wrong way of data analysis and will lead to the wrong result. Okay, actually, I don't get uh, what kind of uh, specific question just now. Can you repeat, Miss Navita? Maybe I can have, and maybe I will have advice. What time of... Uh, more effective and efficient between taking the data? Which method is more effective? Okay, now, if people ask me now, including my own quest, uh, student, they will go for the WhatsApp, okay, Google form, and they spread the uh, questionnaire based on only they, they just blast the questionnaire for those who they have the contact number. But we need to make sure is the contact number who reached our questionnaire or the person that is right or appropriate to answer our questionnaire. So it needs to be reflect back with the title of our research. If we are conducting a research to investigate about student performance and we got the list or our friend to blast the questionnaire and reach another student, then that may be applicable, right? But if we would like to conduct a study uh, that focus more on the uh, maybe level of uh, motivation or level of uh, employee performance in one particular company, so we need to make sure, make sure that we have the number, the phone number of that uh, particular respondent to make sure that the answer that we got is from the valid or accurate respondent. Am I answering uh, you? This one? Daya grab me. Okay. Is that what you would like to hear me? WhatsApp group is, is, is fine, but we need to make sure that the people in the WhatsApp group who reach or who answer our respondent is the right people to answer our questionnaire. If that, we can proceed. That will be no problem. Okay, thank you for answering from, from Professora. And then we have a question from audience in YouTube also with using Bahasa. Is it okay? Okay. Fine, this is fine. from Irwanto Siam. Satu, okay. bagaimana yang dikatakan penelitian kualitatif yang bermutu tapi berbobot? Dan... Boleh, boleh di... Oh. Can you put in the chat box? Oh, okay. I will. Just a moment, please. Formatted to collect data for oh. questionnaire, data science or statistics. Um, I, I, don't, I don't got this, this question. What method to collect data from questionnaire, data science or statistics? What is data science of uh, statistics? I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not understand about data science or statistics. So that one will go later. So I go to Irwanto Syam. Okay. Bagaimana yang dikatakan penelitian kualitatif yang bermutu tapi berbobot oh, saya tak faham itu berbobot what is the meaning of berbobot software apa saja yang bisa digunakan untuk penelitian doktor thesis dan uh, deskripsi ok sebagaimana saya bagi tahu most of the quantitative study they will go to SPSS 
Smart PLS and also AMOS, right? But uh, which a tool that we are going to select, it doesn't matter as long as the tool is applicable or can answer our research question, we, will, we can go. Maybe by the time I conducting or I doing my PhD, by that time, most of us are doing or using the SPSS. But 10 years before this, most of students, they go more for the smart PLS. So it is doesn't matter. So software apa-apa pun, Sekiranya dia menjawab research question yang kita develop, so you, we can go to that one. And also, please try to find a good guru to teach us SPSS and Smart PLS. So it depends on that. So if we start it any part of that, so we will have the teacher to help us. Software apa-apa itu, that is just a tool, a matter of tool untuk nak uh, beri jawapan kepada kita punya research question tadi. So yang tadi yang nombor satu Irwan ni berbobot is what 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 it means ya? Yeah? Uh, bermutu berkualitas berbobot tapi berbobot itu saya tak berapa uh, bahasa tapi... Indonesia. Ha itu saya yeah. kurang faham uh, itu. Yeah, okay so... saya pergi, saya go to the third one bagaimana cara penarikan kesimpulan dalam penelitian kuantitatif. Okay, sama seperti mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, sama juga. Saya uh, yeah. tak berapa faham dengan soalan nombor tiga. And yeah. one, Bagian and one, mana, Miss? Itu nombor tiga bagi penarikan kesimpulan dalam penelitian kualitatif. I I think Irwan tu is more on qualitative method. So oh. as for today, there are two type of research. Qualitative and quantitative. As for today, I go more on the quantitative where we use questionnaire to collect the data. There are another one, we call it qualitative method. In qualitative method, normally we will use the interview session. Interview tak sepertinya quantitative yang questionnaire itu. Sebab interview, dia hanya mungkin ada 10 ke 15 atau ke 20 orang informan untuk answer the question, uh, untuk answer the interview. And as for the qualitative, if uh, Irwan to Syam use the interview, right, they will go for en vivo. And there are another tools, we call it Atlas TI. Okay, this is only a tool or software that can help the qualitative researcher to analyze their data. Okay, that one is not have been touched into this presentation. That is more on qualitative. Okay, and vivo juga bisa. Itu satu lagi Atlas TI. That is the tool for qualitative. Qualitative normally kita guna interview session dan responden atau informannya tidak begitu banyak kerana kita tidak mungkin untuk nak pergi interview interview what we call it in bahasa uh, bahasa Indonesia saya tak tahu okay. interview because it is very time consuming okay jadi kita tidak perlu begitu banyak however untuk qualitative the generalization is not so high sebab kita hanya pergi ke 15 ke 20 informan untuk gather the data so uh, the result cannot be applicable, cannot be generalized to the whole population. Okay, dan jika kita gunakan kuantitatif, biasanya data analysis melalui questionnaire atau survey dan that, uh, software yang kita gunakan selalunya SPSS ataupun Smart PLS. And these two is only a tools. Okay, uh, yang mana-mana juga uh, ikut terpulang, depend kepada researcher. Am I answering? Uh, Miss Irwanto Syam, I guess I can I answer you, yeah? Okay. okay, thank thank you and I will go to the last question. This is from audience in the Zoom chat. Zoom chat from Amin Tohari. Uh, I will read in room chat or another room chat, okay. okay. How do female high school teacher who have been physically assaulted by students overcome their fear so that can effectively teach? How do female high school teacher who have been physically assaulted by students overcome their fear so they can effectively teach? Bisa dibantu mungkin Pak Hengki boleh bantu saya untuk soalan ini. Saya tidak berapa understand uh, in term of the question. Uh, boleh ingin lagi sekali lagi itu agak uh, terlalu cepat ya. Atau kajian ini tentang apa ini? Tentang 
tentang uh, female teacher nak overcome fear saya tak berapa saya uh, I I don't got uh, the question mungkin untuk Amin Tohari ha? bisa dibantu buka suara untuk detail okay, pertanyaannya ah ya uh, uh, yeah. Yang saya faham itu, kajian ini adalah untuk men, uh, um, macam mana itu? Fear overcome the fear. Exalted by student overcome their fear so that they can effectively teach. Okay, so ini adalah untuk dosen wanita ya? Ya, betul. Ya. Kita perlu jalankan kajian. Untuk itu kita perlu jalankan kajian dan kita uh, perlu uh, mengambil dosen wanita yang setelah biasa diganggu itu untuk menjawab kuesyennya kita betul, kerana betul. hanya mereka yang biasa diganggu yang boleh memberi accurate punya pendapat tentang bagaimana mereka akan overcome the fear ok we cannot give the questionnaire to all of the female maybe we can differentiate the questionnaire into two the first questionnaire go to the female who already involved with that uh, problem Right, and another one, we send the questionnaire to all of the female docent and we ask them about their perception because they might not be the person who involved with that assortment. All right, so there will be two type of uh, answer that will be gained at our hand. And, and of course, uh, the good one, we need to go and uh, give the questionnaire to the person who involved with that one and to make it not so what we call it baby the lecturer will not reveal about themselves we can make our question uh, our questionnaire uh, uh, by using the instruction there maybe we just give a very uh, what we call it uh, the question that uh, agak agak agaknya uh, tidak begitu uh, menekankan tentang assignment itu dan mungkin applicable untuk kepada semua female lecturer untuk memberi mereka punya perception towards that how they can overcome the fear when they are maybe uh, physically assaulted by the student or maybe by their it, it, it can have it happen in many type of way maybe by their colleague or also right so not only student and normally if this kind of question or this kind of uh, research We only conduct a research when we have a very clear evidence on that. Because in chapter one, right, we need to provide the issue. If the issue is very uh, minor issue, we are not going to conduct this one. It is more on to one to one case. But if this become the issue, right, most, most of the female lecturer in this institution involved with this scenario, and there are some of the Uh, newspaper cutting also report about that so that will be a start or beginning of us as a researcher to go in that towards that issue okay am i answering uh, mr amin tohari okay i think it's very clearly from professora for answer and i think we don't have no more question again i will go to to the next session time for picture take a documentation yeah so for miss faiz will be handle this session thank you okay thank you miss nokita okay for those who have an activate camera you can activate the camera feed so we can take photos together okay one two three Okay, once again, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. I will return the event to Miss Nautica. I'm good. <laughs> Okay, finally, we come to the end of visiting lecture today. We would like to say thanks again for 
Associate Professor Dr. Umi for their wonderful information and participant in our event again. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your knowledge. We hope this information will be beneficial for our audience. And I hope we can meet again in another event in the future. Also, I would like to thanks for all participants for attending this, way, this visiting lecture and making this event more interesting. At least we hope to have more collaboration with University Malaysia Perlis in the future. This visiting lecture for today and here we hope to see you soon. Thank you and see. Have a nice day for Associate Professor Dr. Umi. Thank you to Miss okay. Kavita, everyone. You stay yeah. calm, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Assalamualaikum yeah. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and see you all. Tania, Prof. Umi. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Bagi yang belum absen, bisa absen terlebih dahulu. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih bagi para peserta yang telah menghadiri acara pada hari ini. Selamat sore dan selamat beraktivitas. Goodbye. Terima kasih Pak Hengki dan semuanya. Goodbye.